This video is brought to you by Squarespace, an all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. Hello humbugs, my name is Mina, and on my channel, if you've never watched a video before, we mostly talk about fashion, culture, and movies, but today I'm getting a little festive, and I wanna talk about Victorian children. Thank you Squarespace for sponsoring this video. So at the moment, I'm building out a website to actually store my projects and we're excited because my videos have been getting more and more research intensive and sometimes the references go over the word count in the YouTube description. So now I need a new landing page and Squarespace has made it super easy for me by offering so many templates, font choices, and color palettes to make my website uniquely me. They have all kinds of features so you can really do whatever you want with your website. I'm personally using their blog page feature to organize my work cited. They also offer email campaigns, so whether it be to promote new products or welcome new subscribers, Squarespace has a template for whatever you need. Check out squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash MinaLight to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. If you're culturally aware, you've probably read Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. And if you're a true Renaissance man, you've probably seen the Muppet Christmas Carol movie or my childhood favorite, the Mickey Mouse version. While no orphans are actually in A Christmas Carol, we do get little tiny Tim, whose fate rests in the goodwill of rotten miser Ebenezer Scrooge. So I love A Christmas Carol. I am currently reading it. I think I've been reading Dolls Chickens. Charles Dickens. I've actually never read it before, but I'm currently reading it and I was actually really surprised by how much I'm liking it because like many other people who grew up in America or I guess England, I assume they also do this in England. I was forced to read Charles Dickens at school. Um, my school curriculum required us to read A Tale of Two Cities, which I had a friend who lovingly called that book A Tale of Two Shitties, and Great Expectations, both books which I sincerely hated at the time. Um, no offense to Dickens, I just genuinely think I didn't like any book that was assigned to me because I don't like being told what to do. Um, I'm someone who loves reading, but I can count on one hand how many books I liked reading in high school that were assigned to me. Um, Lord of the Flies. Maybe that's it. Don't ask me why I liked Lord of the Flies. Actually, okay. I will answer, I liked Lord of the Flies so much, I read it five times in the school period. Like I read ahead of the class and then I kept going back and rereading it. Um, and I guess I just really liked it because these nasty little British snobby boys were <laughs> characterized as these terrible warmongering creatures. It was very vindictive to me reading it as a high schooler. Um, so maybe that's why, but uh, yeah, I didn't like a lot of books. My personal feelings aside, Charles Dickens was a very prolific writer. He's probably the most famous um, author from the Victorian period, and he loved orphans. <laughs> I definitely feel like the way that we think about Victorian children today is based literally on the depictions written by Charles Dickens. In the less literary but still culturally important world of Know Your Meme, <laughs> A few years ago, deep in the pandemic, Twitter user CalGIF posted the prolific tweet, what modern thing do you think would kill a Victorian era child? I think a single sip of Four loco would wipe them out. And since then, many people have offered their own takes of what would theoretically kill a Victorian child. On January 6, 2022, a gimmick Twitter account post to show to a small Victorian child was launched, posting screenshots of social media posts that could potentially traumatize said historical child. A lot of these traumatizing things include overstimulating music, foods, or just strange internet poisoned concepts that would be impossible to explain to someone who was never exposed to social media. For today's video, I wanna look into the world of Victorian children. It feels festive, it feels right. I actually did um, a video for Patreon earlier on showing like the research process for this particular video. And I thought, you know what, maybe I should just like publish a video on it since I've already started the research for it. I feel like Victorian children have always been the butt of jokes and they've just been the butt of jokes for too long. And it's time someone steps up to the challenge to defend these little urchins. I volunteer as tribute. For this video, we are going to be talking about some pretty destitute situations involving children. So if that upsets you, no worries. And I'll catch you next time. All right, let's get started.
Probably no Victorian child gets the most representation today than that of the Victorian orphan. And if you were like me prior to researching for this video, you believe that an orphan definitionally is a child with no surviving parents, like Harry Potter. But that wasn't the case in Victorian England. You could be an orphan if you had living parents who were unable to care for you, or if you just lost one parent, usually your father, and your surviving mother was unable to provide for you. If that was the case, you go live in an orphanage, or if you were luckier, an educational institution, where the philanthropic goal was to offer a place where children could be reared into becoming respectable adults. But not every institution or orphanage was created equal, and the kind of treatment you got depended a lot on your parents. There were two classes of orphans, respectable orphans, who were parentless or fatherless middle-class children, and illegitimate orphans, who were parentless poor children, children of unwed mothers, and children of criminals. And there were some establishments who wouldn't house these illegitimate orphans. For example, Andrew Reed's Infant Orphan Asylum was notorious for only admitting the best orphans. They had a committee that would actually evaluate applicant qualifications and recommendations, and there were benefactors who could even buy a child into the asylum through offering the small fee of 180 to 250 pounds, about 30 to 42,000 pounds in today's money. Basically, it's just like any other modern day university system. You may be wondering though, why would anyone choose to go to an orphanage if their mom was still alive? Well, for many Victorian social reformers, it was considered better for a child to be an orphan than to be tied to their poor family. A philanthropic movement in the 1850s attempted to rescue children from their parents and place them in these orphanages or reform or industrial schools away from the influence of their original homes and where they could ideally gain the skills to get reliable jobs afterwards. Of course, there were also cases where children willingly and even enthusiastically enrolled into these schools because life at home was really bad. For example, in 1870, Mary Ann Navin had to put her daughters under the care of the Princess Mary Village Homes, PMVH for short, when she was arrested for thievery. On her release, seven months later, Mary Ann removed her kids from the school and took them back to her lodgings in London's Devil Acre, where as many as 120 people lived in a single lodging, and the whole place was just like ridden with disease. After the youngest daughter died of smallpox, one of the surviving daughters, Margaret Navin, ran away back to PMVH's mission house and begged for her and her other surviving sister to come back and never leave. At the same time, not every kid wanted to be at these institutions, just like how not every kid in high school wants to read Charles Dickens. This led to groups of children, mainly prepubescent boys, escaping to live independently on the street. So, as I said, the reason we're so aware of the Victorian orphan in particular is because they were stock characters in the Victorian literature that many of us were forced to read in high school, mostly through Man of the Hour, Charles Dickens. Some of Dickens' characters include Oliver Twist, Pip, David Copperfield, Sidney Carton, Martin Chuzzlewit, Nell Trent, and Esther Summerson all orphans. While some Victorian authors arguably had creepy relations with children like Lewis Carroll, um, Charles Dickens had a more justifiable personal tie to the Victorian orphan. At 12 years old, Dickens' father was imprisoned for debt, and so little Charlie had to take a job at Warren's blacking factory to provide for his family. At this factory, Dickens' job was to stick labels onto bottles of boot blacking or boot polish for 10 hours a day, where he earned a very humble six shillings a week. The job lasted only a year, but clearly impacted him for his entire life. Within myself, I had sustained from my babyhood a perpetual conflict with injustice. Charles Dickens described the factory as being a crazy tumble-down old house, abutting of course on the river, and literally overrun with rats. Its wainscoted rooms and its rotten floors and staircase and the old gray rats swarming down the cellars and the sound of their squeaking and scuffling coming up the stairs at all times and the dirt and decay of the place rise up visibly before me as if I were there again. That's actually my biggest nightmare because if anyone knows me at all, I have an extreme like aversion to rats and I know I live in New York City and it's not right for me to live in New York City and hate my neighbors in this way but like there's just something so I don't know I feel like in a past life I died of the plague or something and that's why I have this like aversion to rats that I cannot like I cannot understand why it is it's just like it is what it is 
But anyways, Dickens was so impacted by working at this factory, he even named one of the characters on Oliver Twist, Bob Fagan, who was actually a boy who Dickens worked with in the factory. Like the boy is not exactly the same, but he was just named after um, someone that Dickens actually knew. So I don't think Dickens had a, any like particularly weird obsession with orphans. He really wrote these stories to raise compassion for lower classes. But he wasn't the only writer of this genre. Many Victorians were bothered by the plight of orphans because they felt these large masses of poor children posed a moral threat, and also working class children were thought to be more vulnerable to crime, immorality, and violence, signifying a national moral decay. Dickens aside though, in general, stories about orphans getting like a rags to riches narrative, usually by getting saved by a rich benefactor, were not written purely with good intentions. A lot of the times, these stories stood to reinforce attitudes that Victorians felt towards children. There was an idea that illegitimate children required guidance from philanthropists and religious institutions to achieve any sort of respectability in society. This is also why many of these stories, surprise, ended up with a religious slant in the end. The heroic children are saved by converting to evangelical Christianity. For example, in the 1867 bestseller, Jessica's First Prayer, I wonder what that's about, by Hespa Stratton, follows Jessica, a young street beggar with a neglectful and non-religious alcoholic mother as she finds hope in Christian faith and is eventually adopted by the character Daniel, who also finds religion in the story. It's never too late to find religion in Victorian stories. <laughs> Historian Hugh Cunningham also notes the gender dynamics in many of these stories. While there were some stories like Jessica's First Prayer, which centers a girl, most stories centered boys with girls in the background ready to exert a good influence on the boy. The idea was that if poor boys were able to eventually become patriarchal breadwinners, girls would simply go on to be their wives and their work and education would center around refined domestic activities like cooking and sewing, which were thought to be lacking among working girls. As much tear-jerking literature there was about the poor orphan, there were also many texts from the period discussing the dangers and threats that orphan children posed. Yes, the rumors are true. The Victorian orphan had haters. <laughs> Lisa, I want some more. I hate you. In Sketches of London Life and Character, written in 1849, Albert Smith wrote about how young street entertainers depended on trickery and their begging was just good acting. Even the terms used to describe the orphan, some people called them street Arabs. Obviously, many of these children were not Arabic, but the term was used offensively to illustrate their threatening outsider status. So overall, life for the urban Victorian child was pretty glum, and on top of potentially being orphaned, you had to work. Get your ass up and work. While children have virtually always been in the workforce throughout history, that's not the surprising thing. The late 18th and early 19th centuries saw a rise in rates of child labor due to the Industrial Revolution. Before, children were mainly working in agriculture or at home, but now they were confined within the mills and operating machinery. Also, between the 1860s to 1890s, about 35% of England's population was under the age of 15. For reference, that's about double what it is today in the UK. The demographic imbalance between adults and children made the economy reliant on children participating in the workforce. Factory owners would actually scour orphanages to recruit children to apprenticeships. So, as a child, when were you supposed to start working? The average age for starting work in the mid-19th century was about 11 years old. Average, so there were kids starting at younger ages. Prior to the factory acts that regulated workday hours in the mid 19th century, child labor accounts show many working in the range of 13 hours per day, five days a week, with slightly shortened hours on Saturday and Sundays off for the Lord. If you didn't wanna work in mills, other glamorous jobs for children include selling newspapers, guiding Londoners through thick fogs with torches, yes, that was a real job, uh, shoe polishing and sweeping or I should be more specific, crossing sweeping and chimney sweeping. A lot of people are pretty aware of the horrors of chimney sweeping, an extremely dangerous job that often led to permanent injury. Um, according to Lee Jackson in his book, Dirty Old London, the legs of a typical sweep were an S more than an L in shape with young sweepers limping and hobbling for not one could walk with that freedom and elasticity with which other children move. And many also died. 
According to the papers, in February 1875, 14-year-old George Brewster died from suffocation of soot and ash, and even though he wasn't the first boy to die, his death contributed to Parliament making this form of child labor illegal several months later. The crazy thing is that chimney sweeping was a norm for child laborers since the 17th century, but it's associated with the Victorian era because of the many published accounts of abuse and, of course, photographs. Chimney sweepers or climbing boys were honestly just a highly visible form of class difference, especially because many of them worked in chimneys of the upper class. And yes, it did bother people, um, but not enough to do anything about it for years. One way that society was able to relieve themselves of their guilt was by dedicating an annual festival on May 1st to chimney sweepers. Boys would parade the streets with a jack in the green, um, which was like a green man symbolizing spring and fertility. There would also be a lord and a lady, usually a boy in female attire, whilst the apprentices decorated in ribbons and makeshift finery made noise with their brushes, dustpans, and scrapers, and sang songs, collecting money from passers-by. Speaking of parades, London streets were absolutely filthy, made filthier by the fact that Londoners depended on horse carriage travel, meaning there were lots of horses on the street. And I'm a horse girl, so like, that's a dream. But also, there was lots of horse poop and urine on the street, and that's less of a dream. By the 1890s, there were approximately 300,000 horses and 1,000 tons of poop a day in London. So one of the jobs that 12 to 14 year old boys were employed to do was to dodge between traffic and try to scoop up the poop as soon as it hit the streets. This was a dangerous job too, not only because you could get probably some kind of disease from being in contact with so much poop, but you could also lose a limb or your life from oncoming traffic if you weren't careful or fast enough. Charles Dickens, ever the orphan supporter, actually took an interest in a crossing sweeper who worked near his house. Dickens made sure the boy got his proper meals and sent him to school at night, and when the boy turned 17, Dickens helped him emigrate to Australia. So happily ever after for him. But overall, child labor was cheap. Children and women were paid less because their labor was viewed as supplementary income to the father slash husband who would remain as the family's breadwinner. While there are obviously unfair issues with this kind of logic, it also disproportionately harmed working single mothers and fatherless children, of which made a pretty sizable segment of the population. In the early 19th century, about a fifth of working class fathers died or abandoned their families before their sons reached age 14. But I think it's also important to remember that the Victorian era spanned years, 60 years. Like Miss Queen Victoria was drinking from the fountain of youth, she was eluding the clutches of tuberculosis, syphilis, and what other kinds of diseases that royals were probably even more susceptible to because of um, reasons. She clung onto that crown harder and longer than any other previous English monarch. And there were a series of factory reforms throughout the era, so it definitely sucked more to be a working class child at the beginning of the 1800s than in the late 1800s. For example, the Factory Act of 1844 limited the hours of work that children aged 8 to 13 could do. Um, they could now only work for a modest six and a half hours a day. The hours were limited, but the job itself didn't improve much. The following year, Friedrich Engels published The Condition of the Working Class in England. In it, he notes the dangers of children working in lace factories near the town of Hankley. Angles reported that the children worked in small, ill-ventilated, damp rooms, sitting always bent over the lace cushion. To support the body in this wearying position, the girls wear stays with a wooden busk, which, at the tender age of most of them, when the bones are still very soft, wholly displaces the ribs and makes narrow chests universal. They usually die of consumption after suffering the severest form of digestive disorders brought on by sedentary work in a bad atmosphere. So... To get back to our memes, I always think it's kind of funny that people think Victorian children would be too overstimulated by today's world because I'm like, imagine having to do physical labor for 10 hours a day with these loud ass machines whirring constantly in the background. There are rats running across your feet. It smells fucking awful because no one was wearing deodorant among other odors probably lingering around from, I don't know, the fact that there was not really a real sewage system and also there was like a ton of horse poop on the street, a thousand tons to be exact. Dust is getting in your eyes, in your passageways, and people are probably dying on a regular basis around you and you tell me whether that's less or more stimulating than scrolling on TikTok. <laughs> Upper class children, to be fair, did have it relatively easy 
which isn't really a surprise either. Um, we can take a look at Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. So Carroll published the book in 1865 and the story centers the character Alice, an upper class child who follows a white rabbit because she is bored one golden afternoon sitting and reading by a riverbank which honestly sounds like heaven. Uh, the fictional Alice was based on a real girl named Alice Little, the daughter of Oxford University's dean, um, the institution that Carol was working at at the time. And Carol improvised the story for the first time while taking Alice and her sisters on a boat ride. Also to note, the real Alice Little rocked a short brunette bob, not the long blonde hair that we've come to associate her fictional counterpart with. And as a total sidebar, I also learned recently that for Gossip Girl, a Leighton Meester auditioned for Blair with uh, blonde hair. She had blonde hair at the time. And casting didn't really want to cast her because they didn't want Blair to have blonde hair since Serena already had blonde hair. And so uh, that's why Leighton ended up dyeing her hair brunette so that she could play the role. Anyways, <laughs> blonde Alice's upbringing is evidenced by the snooty little way that she talks, her knowledge of multiplication tables and following of social etiquette. And even as the story descends into a sort of like fever dream, psychedelic madness, um, Alice never forgets who she is. For example, she tells the mock turtle that she attends a day school with lessons in French and music. And when the turtle asks whether she studies washing, she replies, certainly not. Certainly, certainly not. Okay, you know, we're gonna work on that British accent. In contrast, poor children had less access to play. Sociologist Henry Mayhew asserted in London Labor and the London Poor that children of the urban working poor had neither the time nor the space for healthy entertainment. In his description of an eight-year-old girl who was um, selling watercresses, he wrote that she had entirely lost all childish ways and was indeed, in thoughts and manner, a woman. Mayhew noted his conversation with her. At first, I treated her as a child, speaking on childish subjects. When he asked the girl about toys and games, she could only offer a look of amazement. And when he talked to her of parks, she replied in wonder, where are they? Mayhew concluded, all her knowledge seemed to begin and end with watercresses and what they fetched. But despite the advantages that upper-class children had, even they weren't completely immune to oppressive adult figures. Corporal punishment was used on children as young as three years old, and other forms of punishment, including locking a child in a cupboard or uh, sending them to bed without any food, were common as well. Historian Janet Sachs says, though, that physically punishing a child grew less popular over the century. Yay! Um, an emotional blackmail took its place. Boo. Boo! Children were made to feel bad because in some way they had disappointed their parents and God. And even though wealthier children still had proximity to their parents, at least more than Victorian orphans did, the reality was that rich children lived separately from their parents in their own world of the nursery, and the wealthier the parents, the less they knew about the daily routines of their kids. Monitoring children was a servant's job. Parents who had enough money even chose to send their kids to boarding school instead of um, giving them private tutoring, further lessening the amount of time a family would spend altogether. There were all kinds of hazards afflicting the Victorian environment. As we've talked about, there was poop, there were rats. Um, there was also Shields Green, which was named for the Swedish chemist who invented it in 1778. This green, it was a dye, it was everywhere in Victorian England. It was in wallpaper, in paint and book bindings, in candy and cake decorations, in clothing and children's toys. Shields Green was made by blending copper and oxygen with arsenic. <laughs> a toxic substance. And yes, there were records that it killed people. In 1879, a visiting dignitary to Buckingham Palace became ill after sleeping in the green wallpapered guest chamber, leading Queen Victoria to order the removal of said wallpaper. There were also a number of questionable medical practices like bloodletting and harmful medicines on the market. For example, Ayers Cherry Pectoral was advertised as a cure for coughing, cold, the flu, bronchitis, and tuberculosis relief. But it was a mixture of alcohol and opium <laughs> that would now be deemed a poison. <laughs> Coca leaf, from which cocaine is now obtained, was advertised as a nerve and muscle tonic to appease hunger and thirst and to relieve sickness. Winslow's Soothing Syrup was marketed as calming small children and relieving constipation. But each bottle contained a deadly amount of morphine and alcohol. So honestly, I think any Victorian child that survived after taking these medicines could absolutely drink a Four loco totally fine. They actually probably wouldn't even notice any effects at all. 
As for malnutrition, this really comes as no surprise. Writers like Charles Dickens would describe innocent, hungry children all the time in his books. And the high kill rate of many diseases like tuberculosis is attributed to weakened immune systems caused by malnutrition. Of course, as I said before, the Victorian era spanned 60 decades, so there were worse times to be alive than others. The 1840s was an infamous period of famine, noted by historians as the Hungry Forties, for example. Your quality of diet also depended on where you lived, so London in particular was like a nexus of food imports, and so compared to other cities in Britain, a diversity of food was more accessible. And the city of London, which is a district in the greater London area established a large number of wealthy charities that offered money, food, and education to the poor and vulnerable. But in general, the staple diet was white bread made from bolted wheat flour. If a family was better off making about four pounds a week in the 1850s, then they could afford to supplement their diets with vegetables, fruit, and animal-derived products like meat, fish, milk, and eggs. But at the lowest income levels of up to one pound per week, families would have struggled to afford anything more than bread. By the way, one pound in 1850 is about 166 pounds today. Food adulteration was also an issue. In the 1850s, Arthur Hassel and Henry Leatherby conducted 2,400 analyses of about 30 articles of food, drink, and medicines bought in London. They found that alum was mixed with bread in order to make it whiter, which disguised moldy flour. And because alum also retains water, would make the bread heavier so bakers could charge more for it. Um, about half the samples of milk were diluted with up to 45% water. Green tea was also like always faced um, often with harmful coloring matters. And most of the colors used on sweetmeats were poisonous. On top of that, since some of the pigments contained lead, arsenic, and mercury, the sweetmeats likely caused a steady deterioration of health, leading to an early death for many children. Babies rich and poor, have never really been lucky in the health department across the board. It's pretty common knowledge that infant mortality rates were really high during the Victorian era. In the mid-1800s, there were around 150 deaths for every 1,000 live births in England and Wales, and there was little significant change in the level until well after 1900. Most of us know that many deaths were caused by bad birthing care and lack of vaccinations, but diet also played a huge part in infant mortality. Parents straight up did not know how to take care of their kids, and mothers resorted to reading a reference guide like the 1861 book, Mrs. Beaton's Household Management, for tips. But these authors didn't really know much of anything either. In the book, writer Isabella Beaton dedicates two chapters on baby care, including useful tips for breastfeeding, such as consuming a ton of beer. <laughs> Beaton also advertised uh, using a baby bottle. So in general, the marketing of baby bottles put a huge pressure on women to abandon breastfeeding. With product names like Mummy's Darling, Little Sherub, or even names such as The Empire Bottle or The Alexandria. They were really suggesting that for a woman to choose the bottle made her a much better citizen of the empire and that she was essentially doing the right thing for her children. But this was a problem because these bottles got disgusting real quick. The Victorian baby bottle had a slanted shape, which made it very hard to clean away any residue that was left at the bottom. The rubber stopper and tubing were porous, and the porous material sucked up bacteria, which, even if left for a few hours, accumulated enough bacteria to cause an infection. The stopper itself, as recommended by Mrs. Beaton, was left tied on for the two or three weeks it lasted and never washed. The baby formula that was recommended to mothers by influential figures such as Mrs. Beaton, she was literally like the Martha Stewart of infant mortality it seems, like from what I'm reading. Um, this formula consisted of flour mixed with water with the occasional addition of wine, beer, or sweeteners. This formula was called PAP or Panada and was given to babies in place of breastfeeding or as a transition to solid food. If it wasn't clear ready by the presence of beer and wine, PAP was a dangerous food because it was nutritionally inadequate. Breast milk naturally has a lot of nutrients, flour does not. PAP was also kept warm for long periods of time in a ceramic food warmer in conditions ideal for the growth of bacteria. Yeah. As a note, I don't want to put sole blame on Victorian mothers. I want to put all blame on Isabella Beaton. <laughs> Just kidding. But, you know, in general, doctors were talking out the wazoo, giving terrible misinformation. A family doctor writing for Castle's Family Magazine in 1881 suggests that infants should be fed two to three times a day, which we now know is an egregiously small number. But also, many mothers themselves were sick post-birth, and so breastfeeding was not always an option. 
Others were working long hours and lack of maternity leave meant that they had to return to work sometimes days after giving birth, meaning that they'd be separated from their babies for long periods of time. But overall, the Victorian era was rife with dangers and health disasters. Uh, London's sewage system, which I mentioned briefly earlier, wasn't completed until the mid 1870s. So before then, sewage was a disaster. Victorian homes had a cesspool rather than a toilet. Cesspools were like these deep holes that people would use in place of a toilet. But over time, the cesspool would fill up and night workers would have to go around and empty them. Even though it was discouraged, some people would dump buckets of feces into the sidewalk in the middle of the day. Have some decency, people. Much of the poor infrastructure meant that the Thames became a dumping ground for human, animal, and industrial waste. What was even grosser, though, is that many Londoners were also drinking from it since pipes were connected to the river, leading to dysentery, typhoid, and cholera. In 1834, the humorous cleric Sidney Smith said, He who drinks the tumbler of London water has literally in his stomach more animated beings than there are men, women, and children on the face of the globe. So in conclusion, Four Loco has nothing on London drinking water from the 1830s. I also just want to read this tweet out for everyone because I think it's apt and it kind of sums up the rest of this video. We're always talking about how nerds rope would kill a Victorian child, but like, could any of us sweep a chimney? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is the end of the video. Thank you all so much for listening, paying attention, being a part of this community of uh, Victorian orphan enthusiasts in a non-creepy way. And yeah, I I don't know. I just like, I thought it was interesting. I feel like when I first saw this meme, I immediately had this like reaction to it where I was like, but those children were so like much more robust than than me, than like most of us. Um, and so, you know, for a while I thought about like doing a video on such, but I was like, this is such a weird video to do. And then I realized, you know what, like I just made a video on hats and I've made tons of like really just not asked for videos before. So, you know, why not? Why not? Yeah, thank you everyone. I hope you have a lovely holiday season, rest of your holiday season, and I'll chat with you next time. Okay, bye. <laughs>